open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Just a moment. Appreciate you being here. It's a cool, cold, nasty night out there. And uh, it would have been so much easier just to curl up on the couch with a book or watch an old movie or something. And yet you made the trip. And you're here, and I appreciate that very much. Just a couple of announcements. First of all, I demand a recount on this morning's service. The board says 98. Erin was here. She's pregnant. That's 99. And we ought to be able to get one more so we could have had triple digits. But uh, I thought that was a good crowd. We had... Uh, Sarah and I were talking at lunch. We had a number of our folks who are not here, who are either sick or out of town, and uh, that was a good crowd for us, and uh, I appreciate that. I think Daryl is downplaying the seriousness of what he's having tomorrow. Kella talked to me, and she says that he has two blockages. One of them is 95%, and the other is not quite that much, but is severely blocked. And uh, they're hoping that stents will do the job, but they have no assurance of that. If they do not do the job, they will do open-heart surgery right there at that time while he's on the table. So please remember him. And uh, uh, Chris, if uh, I hear to the contrary, whatever I hear, and it needs to go out to the congregation, I'll let you know, and you can get an email out on that and let the congregation know about that. Harold's a good guy. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he really touched me uh, back during the worst of the snow. Uh, I got a call one day, and it was Daryl, and he said, uh, Tom, this is Daryl. Uh, do you need anything? And I said, no, we're just fine. He said, well, now listen, if you need somebody to go to the store for you, if you need anything at your house, you call me, and I'll be right there. And I, I found that touching, that he would think of us and... Uh, uh, would volunteer to go out on a day that we shouldn't be out, uh, but he was willing to do that if we needed anything. And, and I appreciate people like that. That's what Christianity is about, folks. It really is. That's what Christianity is about. And I hope that you will keep him in your prayers. It was awfully nice to sit on this side tonight in front of the singers. Sounded beautiful. Thank you, kids. Appreciate it very much. Let me give you a brief introduction uh, to Ephesians 1 by going back and giving in just a moment to bring us up to date. Uh, the first 14 verses of Ephesians 1 had to do with um, being in Christ. That's a phrase that's just used over and over and over and over again. In Christ, in Him, in whom. And we notice that all spiritual blessings are in Christ. We notice that we are chosen in Christ. We notice that we are redeemed in Christ. We notice that all things are brought together in Christ. We notice that our inheritance is in Christ. And we notice that there is trust that we can have in Christ. And finally, that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit in Christ. When you read a list like that, you just kind of want to say, wow. Being in Christ must be an awfully important thing. What's next in the chapter is a prayer that Paul prayed for the Ephesians. That's in verses 15 through 23, and that's what we'll talk about tonight. Now, this is not unusual. If you read what we refer to as the Pauline epistles, that's the epistles, the letters that Paul wrote, you'll find that he often let the people know he was praying for them. On more than one occasion, I have been chastised for some things I've said. One of them is I've bragged on people in the congregation. I had a deacon tell me one time that uh, they would get their reward later. I didn't need to say anything good about them on earth. I guess well, Paul didn't get that, that, that letter. He didn't get that note. And uh, when I tell people in the congregation, I'm praying for you, I don't need to tell them that, I just need to do it. And Paul didn't get that memo either. Because repeatedly in the epistles, he said to people, 
I'm praying for you. And if there was something good about them, he mentioned it. He praised them for what they were doing as was right. You can find that in Romans. You can find that in 1 Corinthians. You can find it in Philippians. And you can find it in 2 Thessalonians. So it's not unusual that Paul would say, I'm praising you for some things here, and I'm praying for you. And what I want us to look at tonight is his prayer, because I think it's a prayer that uh, I want you to know I pray for you, and I trust that you pray for all of us together, that these things would be true. Let me read, first of all, verses 17 and 18. Actually, I'll begin back at 15 to kind of catch us up. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now I want you to notice, first of all, that the prayer was addressed to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. Sometimes we have a hard time getting our minds wrapped around who we're to pray to. And we often find people praying to Jesus. Now, I'm not saying on some occasions that that cannot be substantiated from Scripture. For instance, uh, the first Christian martyr, Stephen, said, Lord Jesus, uh, receive my spirit. Uh, however, the rule, the principle is that prayer is to be addressed to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. We pray to our Father in heaven. Now we pray in the name of Jesus. He is our intermediary. He is our go-between. And so when we approach the Father, we approach him because of our relationship with Jesus. It is absolutely proper to say our Father in heaven as we begin, and to say, in Jesus' name, as we conclude. And so Paul certainly did that. He prayed to the Father, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. Now notice that he also mentioned that there were some things that he knew about them. Did you catch that? He knew about their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love for all the saints. Well, now wouldn't that be a wonderful thing for anybody to say, I've heard some good stuff about you. What have you heard? I've heard that you have faith in the Lord Jesus, and I've heard that you love one another. Now that would just be about tops, wouldn't it? As a matter of fact, in the class that I teach on Sunday mornings, we're, we're talking about discipleship. And we dealt with, among other passages, John 13 this morning. When Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Uh, the proof of our uh, uh, being his disciples, or one of the proofs, is that we just love one another like he loved us. And so Paul had heard some very good things. I've heard about your faith, and I've heard about your love. And now he prays some specific things for them. He prays that there were some things that he wanted them to have, that he wanted them to know. And he's very specific about that. He said, first of all, I want you to have knowledge. I want the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. He says in verse 17 that you may have knowledge of him. Uh, you see that uh, Paul wanted the people in Ephesus to be knowledgeable. Now, we can gain that knowledge in more than one way. We can, we can uh, gain that knowledge through our own study. We can also gain that knowledge by coming to class and coming to sermons and hearing the preaching. Uh, the purpose of these things is to help us have more knowledge. But can, uh, with knowledge, he wanted them to have wisdom. 
Now that's totally different than knowledge. Wisdom is the ability to use what you know. And I know people who have a lot of knowledge who do not have a bit of wisdom as to how to apply it. And as a matter of fact, they would rather beat you over the head with truth like a club than to lovingly explain things to you so that you can know about them and make the proper response. Wisdom is the right kind of spirit in using the knowledge that you have. As a matter of fact, James said in James chapter 1 and verse 6, If any man lack wisdom, let, he at, let him ask of God, who gives to all men lay, uh, liberally and upbraideth not. That's the old King James translation, the way I learned it. If you want wisdom, ask God. Never in the Bible do we read a passage that says, If you want knowledge, ask God. If you want knowledge, study. If you want knowledge, read. If you want knowledge, listen. If you want wisdom, ask God. And so Paul is saying, I want you to have knowledge and I want you to have the wisdom of how you're supposed to apply that. I think a passage that goes hand in hand with this is back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you want to look there for just a moment with me beginning at verse 10. That's 1 Corinthians, chapter 2 rather, I said 1, but it's, uh, it's chapter 2. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in the man? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak. Now, I want you to notice the progression. Paul says, God through His Spirit revealed these to us. That's inspiration. That's God, through the Holy Spirit, revealing His will. And he makes the point, the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God. And so he revealed the mind of God. He says, there's nobody who knows what's in the mind of God except the spirit of the man who's in him. Now, we need to mark that down, because how many times have you heard somebody say, I know exactly what you're thinking? Well, you don't. You may guess, and you may be right, but you don't know. What you know is what you do and why you do it, not what I do and why I do it. The Spirit of God knows the mind of God and has revealed that, and Paul said, we received it. We wrote it down, and we speak it. Did you get the progression? God, through the Spirit, to men like Paul, who wrote it down to people like us. It's possible for us to know it's possible for us to have knowledge. And Paul said, I want you to have knowledge, and I want you to have wisdom to go with it, so you'll have uh, the right kind of attitude in using what you know. And then he also prayed for them, if you are back in Ephesians chapter 1, that uh, their understanding might be enlightened. He says, I want you to, I want you to see some things. I want your spiritual eyes to be open. Often, when we look at Scripture, we look at it strictly from a physical standpoint, and sometimes it doesn't make any sense to us. Because it's just like our computer says, does not compute, does not compute. Because we're looking at it as we think. We're looking at it in a strictly secular personal, fleshly way. He says, I want your spiritual eyes to be open. Can you see things? If you read the passage that's up there in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 15, Jesus said that there were people he knew who had closed their ears and shut their eyes. Did you ever have your children do this? 
when you're telling them something, they stick their hands in their ears, go, da, 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 da. what does that tell you? I'm not listening to anything you're saying. We can do that spiritually. We can say, God, I'm not listening to anything you're saying, and I'm not seeing anything you're saying because I don't like it. It doesn't suit me and what I think and what I want. There are things in the Bible, frankly, that I wish weren't there because the fact that they're there condemns some people that I love very much. But that doesn't mean I can just take them out and ignore them and shut my eyes or close my ears. I can't do that. And so you see the prayer that Paul is saying. He said, I want you to have knowledge. I want you to have the wisdom to use the knowledge. I want you to have your eyes open and your ears open so that you can hear. Pretty good prayer, don't you think? That we would pray for people. First, or Colossians, rather, is a parallel passage. Uh, I think this illustrates that... Uh, uh, Paul didn't always just say this something to one person or one church. He said it repeatedly because it bore repeating. In Colossians chapter 1, if you'll pick up the reading with me there, in verse 9 he says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Doesn't that sound a whole lot like what I just said? That you would be filled with wisdom or knowledge and wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That sounds a whole lot like what he said to the Ephesians. And folks, that's what I say to you. My prayer for you is that you will be filled with knowledge. My prayer for you is that you will have the wisdom to use it properly. My prayer for you is that you will have spiritual understanding that your eyes will be open and your ears open to truth. Now the Ephesians had turned away from darkness. They had been turned to the light and Paul wanted them to grow in their understanding and application of truth. That's how he began his prayer. If you read with me verses 18 and 19, you find another thing that he prayed for them. He said, beginning in 18, and I'll get down to the end of it, which will fit into the next verse, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. There's one of them. The hope of his calling uh, he wanted them to understand something about the hope that they had in regard to God's calling in all the knowledge of him. He said then in verse 19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? Okay, Paul, what is it you want them to know? What specifically do you want them to see? He said, first of all, I want you to know the hope of your calling. I want you to understand that because you've been called by God through the gospel, that you have a tremendous hope. Would you want to live in a world without hope? Despair is a terrible thing. When people just give up and they say, there's no hope. Have you ever had someone say that in regard to a medical situation? And that, that just fills you with despair. When a doctor says, I'm sorry to tell you this, there's no hope. There's nothing we can do. And you just go, oh. Just sucks all of the life out of you. And Paul said, I want you to know the hope of your calling. Hebrews 6.19 says it is the anchor of the soul. It's what keeps us steadfast. And folks, I want you to know the hope of your calling. I want you to know that you have a glorious hope. I want you to know that this world is not hopeless for you. Now the world itself is hopeless, but you're not hopeless in the world. And that you have hope of something beyond this world. And that's what keeps you anchored here. He said at the end of verse 18, I want you to know the riches of his glory. I want you to know what he has waiting for you. 
Now that's pretty spectacular. When you stop and think what God has waiting for us, 1 Peter 1 and verse 4, this is one of those verses that you just need to know because of the encouragement that it gives. He says, to the, or to an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. What do you have? You have the hope of heaven. Is that pretty good? You think about all that's wrong with this world, and that you have the hope of a place that's not anything like this world. And yet, I hear people who want to know what we're going to do in heaven. They want to know if we're going to do uh, the kind of stuff we do in this world. Like, well, I don't like it while it's here anyway. Why would I want to do it there? I heard a fellow say, if they don't have golf in heaven, I don't want to go. Well, bless your heart. It seems to me that that's a pretty petty thing to, to, to want in this earth. We want to say, well, if we can't do this, I don't want to go. If we don't have this, I don't want to go. I heard a person say, if they don't have my pets there, I don't want to go. Like, well, I love my pets too. But uh, when it comes to heaven, they're on their own, okay? You know what I mean? Uh, it's about me and people I know and love. And so uh, Paul says, I want you to know the riches of his glory. And would you notice the superlatives that he used? He said, uh, the riches. He said, the glory. He said, the inheritance. Pretty spectacular things, I think. And then he said, I want you to know the greatness of his power in verse 19. I want you to understand some things about how powerful God is. And you'd have to have a, a, a Greek lexicon, perhaps, uh, to, to get the words. He uses <coughs> three different words in this text. He uses the word dunamis, which is just the word that's translated mostly power. It's here the working of his power. He used energia. Do we have to guess what we would get from that? How about energy? And he used energia as his mighty power. He talks about the lakos, which is the great inherent strength. It seems to me that he goes to great extremes to say, I want you to know something about God's power. It's pretty spectacular. And when you stop and think about it, it is. We talk about those omni words in reference to, to God, and one of them is omnipotence. That means that he's all-powerful. That means that there's nothing God can't do except those things, now listen to me here, that would keep him from being God. Did you get that? There are some things God can't do and still be God. For instance, God can't tell a lie. Because if he told a lie, he wouldn't be God anymore, would he? And so God can do anything except those things that keep him from being God that are absolutely out of character with his nature. But otherwise, he has all powerful. He can do it. That's his point to the Ephesians. That's his point to people who are struggling anywhere at any time. You can trust God. God can do it. God can be with you. God can get you through this. God can give you hope. God can give you all of those things that we talked about in the first part of the chapter through Jesus. God is powerful. There are things that we would like to do for people. We just don't have the power to do it, right? Sometimes we don't have the financial power to do it. Sometimes even if we had the financial power, we still couldn't do what needs to be done. But God is not limited as we are. He's omnipotent. He can do it. He has all of that wonder-working, miraculous, wonderful power. That's why we pray, isn't it? Isn't that why we pray? Don't we pray because we believe God can do it? 
If I pray for somebody who's sick and I don't believe God can do anything, why pray? Why waste my breath? John led us in prayer for different people tonight. He led us in prayer this morning for various people who are sick. Uh, John, did you believe that God could do something about that? Yeah, otherwise, why pray? I believe that my God is powerful in God, and Paul wanted the Ephesians to know that. And then he wanted to, them to know how God had demonstrated his power in verses 20 through 23. It's as if he says, I know that some of you are going to say, God's powerful. Well, how is he powerful? Explain it to me. Pick up the reading with me at verse 20. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Do you realize in those verses, Paul mentions three things that show God's power? Now, if this were a test, I would say, can you find the three things in that passage that demonstrate the power of God? The first one is the resurrection which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Did that take some power? I, uh, I have heard uh, supposed miracle workers who claim to do some pretty spectacular things. Uh, they claim to heal people who have cancer. Or they claim to uh, heal people who have Alzheimer's and do some things like that. But I have never seen a one of them take a person who is bona fide dead, and all of the tests demonstrate that, and so dead that like Lazarus, they had already begun to decay, and then to raise them from the dead. Never saw that happen. And yet, when Jesus died, he was bonafide dead. Everybody that had anything to do with it believed that. Pilate certainly did that. He released the body. The soldiers certainly did that because they went to break the knees of the people to hasten death and they said Jesus is dead already. The Jews believed that because they didn't want anybody to steal the body and they wanted uh, guards placed at the tomb. The women certainly believed that because they went back on that early Sunday morning to prepare the body for burial. Everybody believed Jesus was dead. And yet, on that Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. How did that happen? By the power of God. God had the power to bring Jesus out of the tomb. As a matter of fact, Romans 1 4, which is a favorite verse of mine, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, listen, by the resurrection from the dead. What proves conclusively that Jesus Christ is the Son of God with power? The resurrection from the dead. And Paul said, secondly, the exaltation. He says that he has raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. When Jesus was transfigured, this happened 40 days after he was raised from the dead. He made appearances for 40 days. But at the end of that 40-day period, when he was proving to people that he was indeed alive, he was transfigured. He was taken up to heaven. You can read about it in Acts 1. 
And how did that happen? What caused that? What caused Jesus just to be transfigured, raised up from earth and taken to heaven to sit at the right hand of God? What caused that? Well, clearly, it was the power of God. You want to know how powerful God is? Look at the fact that Jesus now reigns at the right hand of God. I know what our Pentecostal folks say or our uh, folks who believe in pre uh, premillennialism say. They say that Jesus is coming back again someday to reign on earth. Folks, Jesus is reigning now. He's sitting at the right hand of God in heaven. He has ascended to be there. That demonstrates the power of God. But what else tells you about the power of God? That begins in verse 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What did you say, Paul? What shows the power of God? He made Jesus the head of the church. He put all things under his feet. He's head over all things to the church. The church does not have a heavenly head and an earthly head as the Roman Catholic Church teaches. They believe that Jesus is the heavenly head of the church, but that the Pope is the earthly head of the church. Nothing could be further from the truth. The church only has one head, and that head is Christ. And that's why we call it His church. Why would we want to call the church by a name that gives the praise to men? Martin Luther, the great reformer, was very upset that people who followed him called themselves Lutherans. He said, don't do that. He said, do not call yourselves Lutherans. Call yourselves Christians. It's not about me. It's about him. And folks, it is about him. I'm not the head of this church. The elders are not even the head of this church. Christ is the one and only head of the church. He has been placed in that position. How did that happen? By the power of God. Paul's prayer is that I want you to know the power of God. How do we know that power, Paul? Look at the resurrection. Look at the ascension. Look at the fact that Christ is the head of the church. And you'll see in that the demonstration God can do it. God can make it happen. God is omnipotent. Let me give you a final word. As Christians, we need to pray for one another. Paul in Colossians 1.5 said that. I think that lifting somebody's name up in prayer or a group of people's name up in prayer is one of the greatest things we can do. We say sometimes, well, I can't do much, but I can pray for you. Listen, that's no little thing. Don't demean the fact that you pray for people because that means you take their name to the throne of God, to the one who can do something, to the one who is omnipotent, to the one who has the power to do the things that we just talked about. It's a wonderful thing to lift up people's names in prayer. And one of the things that I appreciate about the congregation here, and I remember when the Adairs went here, that Patty remarked several times that she saw that this was a praying church, that we had more prayers in our service than anybody she had ever seen. And that's a good thing. 
And I like the fact that our shepherds, our elders, lead us in prayer every Sunday morning and every Sunday night for people in the congregation. They name names. And, and sometimes somebody will lift my name up to God, and that's a special thing. When I was talking with Kella this morning about Daryl, I said, I want you to know something, Kella. I have already prayed for him, and I will continue to do so that. And she just teared up, and she said, thank you. That means a lot. It does mean a lot, not because it's me. My prayers don't have any more power than your prayer. It just means that we have taken that petition to the one who can. May I pray this prayer for you? I'm going to ask you just to sit and listen carefully as I read Paul's prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And the congregation said, Amen. That's my prayer for you.